Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Jamara Presbyterian Church. This morning is a little bit different from usual in the sense that you'll be tuning in either from the internet site, uh, from the link on the church website, uh, from the Facebook page, or you'll be listening in on CD. And so welcome along this morning. Uh, we want to try and make things as normal as possible, so please do feel free uh, to worship with us in the way that you would normally sing the songs, pray with me whenever I pray, and engage whenever it comes to the preaching of God's Word. I want to make just a couple of announcements for our own people at this stage. If you're tuning in from other parts of the world, you're very welcome. Um, as you enter our historic meeting house, there's a, a, a little stone inscription above the, above the door that, which says, to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We want to keep doing that today. This is still God's day. We want to still praise and worship Him. And so wherever you are in the world, you're welcome to join with us as we praise and worship. But just some announcements for our own people. The first one is this. If you came along to Nathan Redmond's coffee morning last week, uh, Nathan's grateful for all of the, the money that was received. His trip to Thailand in connection with his studies at Belfast Bible College has been postponed, but it will still carry on at some stage in the near future. And so that money will still be put to good use and Nathan still thanks you for your generosity. I've been in touch with a food bank in Drumore. And so if you can, first of all, um, buy extra food whenever you're out shopping and leave it in one of the, the, the trolleys or one of the collection points at either the, the Tesco store in Babbridge Town or the, the Super Value or the Eurospar in Drumore or some of the local, local shops, that would be appreciated. But also, if you yourself are in need at this time, please do get in touch with me and a delivery can indeed be, be brought to you into your home. If you're thinking about God, and preparations for eternity over this time. If you require a Bible, um, if you require a telephone call, if you require prayer at this time, please get in touch with me. Or if you're self-isolating due to COVID-19, we'll endeavour to help you with the following, the picking up of shopping, the picking up of a, of a medical prescription, posting mail, a friendly phone call or urgent supplies. Also, please get in touch with myself at this time. Uh, there are people um, who are in place that will be able to help you um, as we all grapple and cope with this together. It's also my intention to try and create a church WhatsApp group. Um, in our Holiday Bible Club group, somebody had suggested this, and at this time of being able to contact each other, pray for each other, share stories, and the like, it might be a good thing. So if you want to be involved in a church WhatsApp group, please send your name and your mobile number to the church Facebook page where I can pick it up, um, or if you're listening on the CD, just phone the man's phone and leave it. Leave your, your mobile number and your name, and I'll be able to add you in. I think though, those are all the announcements that I want to bring to your attention. We're going to be looking forward to coming back to this place again after all of this is over. And so please use this time as a real time of anticipation and of excitement of being back here again. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, it says, don't forsake the meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And so it's a real shame that we can't meet together. But I hope that in the first Lord's Day that we're back here again, we'll be back here again with real excitement and with real enthusiasm to come back here and be together. Maybe we'll organize a church weekend at home. Maybe we'll organize some extra congregational activities, but we'll do something to really celebrate being back together and really celebrate being back as God's people, worshiping and praising Him again. The psalmist says in Psalm number 103, Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit? And who crowns you with steadfast love and with mercy? Who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? The Lord who works righteousness. The Lord who is the Lord of justice for all who are oppressed. Yes, he has made known his way to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. For the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Let us worship God together. Is 
God, my soul, with all my heart, let me exalt his holy name. Forget not all his benefits, his praise my soul in song proclaim. The Lord forgives you all your sins and heals your sickness and distress. Your life he rescues from the grave and crowns you in his tenderness, and crowns you in his tenderness. He satisfies your deep desire from his unseeing stores of good, so that just like the eagle's strength, your thoughtful vigor is renewed. The Lord is known for righteous acts and justice to done trod in words. To Moses he made known his ways, he mighty deeds to Israel's sons, his mighty deeds to Israel's sons. Is merciful and kind, to anger slow and full of grace. He will not constantly reprove, or in his anger hide his face. He does not punish or misuse, or give our sins their just reward. How great his love as high as men towards all those who fear the Lord, towards all those who fear the Lord. God's kindly rule is over all, in heaven he has set his throne. O oh, you his angels, praise the Lord, strong ones by whom his will is done. Oh, praise the Lord, you heavenly host, his servants who perform his word. Praise God, his works throughout his realm. And you, my soul, oh, praise the Lord. And you, my soul, oh, praise the Lord. Well, we've been able to sing to God's praise and read from his word. Let's now come before his face now in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come before you and we thank you for the words that we've been able to sing together. Words from Psalm number 103, recognizing that, Lord, you are the one who forgives. You're the one who heals. You're the Lord, the one who blesses. And so, Father, we come before you and we thank you for every blessing that we do enjoy. And Lord, even as we sit in our homes, we sit in warmth, we sit, Lord, with food in our bellies. We have risen from beds that we've laid our heads upon. And Lord, we bless you and we thank you. And Lord, even as we sit here today, we still need to continue to keep focusing our hearts and our minds on you. We continue to stray from you and to stray from your presence. And Lord, if we were to read on in that psalm, the psalm says, as far as east is from the west, so far as hast thou removed our transgression from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Lord, we fear you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we praise you. We praise you because of your son, the Lord Jesus. And Lord, as we'll think about later on in the service, we thank you that you're the one who we can delight in and yet you were the one who was despised. But thank you, you're the one that will never desert us. You're the all-present, all-loving God. And Father, your people claim your promise today. May they hear your words of forgiveness as they come and pray with one accord. As far as east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgression from us. We claim that promise through Christ. And Lord, even as we sit in our own homes, how good it is to think about the words which Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, 
forever and ever. Amen. So boys and girls, we haven't forgotten about you. Um, during our services that are going to be broadcast online, we're going to have some special children's addresses for you. Um, and I'm glad that we're going to call these the preacher and teacher children's addresses um, because, uh, well, I'm maybe not much of a preacher and the person that's coming along isn't much of a teacher, um, but uh, we're glad to have him. Um, Johnny's training to be a science teacher. And so we're going to do some, some science experiments over the next few weeks. Um, so I'm going to go over here and uh, we're going to have some fun as we think about how we might bring science and the gospel together. Yeah, so as you've said, Scott, um, I'm training to be a science teacher, so I go to Stranmillis. And obviously with the whole coronavirus um, crisis going on, teachers have found themselves with time off for the first time in a couple of weeks now, um, which means we have a lot of free time to do things. And I personally have decided to do some experiments. In and this is what time. you're going to be doing over all your holidays. Yes, this exactly. This is what you do at home all day. You think about little science experiments just yes. like this. So this is a very simple experiment. Um, that I'm going to show you today. Um, but first of all, I thought I'd present you with a little safety jacket. Good, so I need my, my science coat as well. Absolutely. Um, because believe, believe it or not, you know, I, I do have A-levels in sciences, so uh, this, will, this will help, you know. So uh, um, you're going to teach me, but uh, maybe I'll learn some. Maybe I'll be able to teach you along the way as well. Hopefully so. Um, Good. So this is going to be some explosive science today. So I have with me a bottle of Diet Pepsi, um, and I have also with me some Mentos. Now these are mint Mentos, so that's important for the experiment. And so you're, you're advising that the boys and girls try this at home? Well, because assuming I, the correct I, I, I'm precautions. Being, I'm being prepared that I'm not the one that's going to say that, so <laughs> are, you, you, are you advising that the boys and girls try this one at home? Um, maybe in an outside environment. Okay. Um, so what we're gonna do, we're going to remove the lid of our Pepsi. Just carefully making sure that it doesn't bubble over. And what we're going to do, I have my Mentos. I've made a little tube out of paper. And I also have a piece of card. So we're going to put the card on top of our paper tube and turn it over. And gently set it on top of our bottle. Now the hope is that whenever we remove the cardboard, the Mentos will go into the bottle of Pepsi and we're hoping for an explosion of Pepsi. Right, so we're going to cause an explosion. Yes, that's the plan. Um, now, you might be wondering what, what causes the explosion. Um, for those of you who are, who are wondering... So you're going to talk about the science behind yeah, all of exactly. this? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so the Mentos will go to the bottom of the Pepsi bottle, um, and whenever they do that, all the fizz in the bottle will be drawn to the bottom, and it will cause the rest of the Pepsi to shoot up the top and hopefully we'll get an explosion. So we're going to cause an explosion here in church today? Yes. So this is just like, almost like dynamite? A, a little bit like dynamite. Oh wow, okay, we're going to ha have dynamite in church here today. So it's a good job, boys and girls, that you actually aren't sitting here where you would normally sit because there's a real danger that they might get covered. Yes. That, and so notice that we have taken every precaution here today to ensure that everything is well cleaned <laughs> and well well um, maintained, so there's nothing over anything. So, um, okay. Are we right. ready? I'm ready if you are, yes. Yeah, you might want to take a couple of steps back. Right, okay, I'll Would stand back. Advice. Okay, right. Leave it to the science expert. i leave it, i leave <laughs> it to the science expert, okay. And three, two, you might want to move your Bible. Right, okay. <laughs> three, two, one. Oh. And there we have our explosion. Well done. Even with some of them not quite going in, we yeah. still had quite an explosion there. Um, and so that was great. Um, when we practiced this yesterday, um, we practiced it on a, on a different bottle of coke and it only came to it here. So that yeah. was a good number of feet into the air. That was good. Um, and boys and girls, um, what Johnny has just shown us reminds me of a little verse in the New Testament. Because in Acts chapter 1, we read these words. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. And the word power here, actually, in the original language, is the same word where we get the word dynamite. And so whenever you trust in Jesus, whenever you trust in him as your own personal Savior and Lord, you receive power. 
dynamite. You receive the ability to be able to tell other people about the good news of Jesus. And there's lots of times we read this power in the New Testament. Um, in fact, the, the, the same connotation is in, in Philippians chapter 4. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And in these days, maybe you're thinking to yourself, what can I do? What can I do during these times of being shut in and not being, not being able to be at school? By trusting in Jesus, he will give you power. Power to trust in him. Power to believe in him. Power to be able to tell others about him. Power in these days. And we need that power. Power if we're cooped up. Power if we can't do the things that we normally do. And we're grateful that Jesus meets our every need and he gives us power. So boys and girls, don't forget that whenever you trust in Jesus, and when you think to yourself, how can I have the strength to be able to say no to the sin that I've been doing? How can I stop doing the things that I know that are wrong? How can I trust in Jesus and commit my life to him? How can I tell others about him? Jesus gives you power, dynamite, real dynamite power to be able to do such things. We're going to sing together, so let's sing. So let's continue now in the worship of God as we pray our prayers of intercession, our prayers for others. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come before you once again into your most holy presence. And Father, we want to implore and we want to beseech you that, Lord, you would stop in its tracks the spread of this coronavirus. Lord, we see how it has brought nations and governments we see how it has brought airports and schools, hospitals and even churches to a standstill. And yet, Lord, we still claim the promises of your word that you're sovereign. We still recognize that you sit on the eternal throne and you can bring diseases to naught. And so, Lord, we pray for this disease to stop. We pray for a cure to be found. We pray, Lord, for you to reign supreme. But, Father, in the midst of what is going on, we continue to pray we want to pray, Lord, for those who are in positions of authority, those who are in governments. We pray for our Prime Minister. We pray, Lord, for our Executive and for our First Minister and Deputy First Minister at Stormont, that, Father, they would have great wisdom 
and exercise great discernment as to what to do at this time. Thank you, Lord, that you've been with them heretofore. Continue to go before them, we pray you. Father, for those in the health professions, for doctors, for nurses, for medical staff, for pharmacists, for hospitals, for those places that are inundated with the sick, Lord, we pray for them. Grant them tenacity and fortitude and wisdom. Lord, help them as they care for those who need care the most. We pray, Lord, for supermarkets, for the staff thereof. We pray, Lord, for the delivery drivers, for those that, Lord, are providing food and nourishment and for the things that we so desperately still need. Lord, bless them, we pray. For care staff, for those who are in jobs that will not be able to isolate themselves from this disease. Lord, we pray for them. And Father, as we, we pray, we want to pray for our own community. We pray for those, Lord, that are self-isolating, that, Lord, you keep them safe. We pray for the vulnerable in our society. We pray for, Lord, those who are sitting and thinking, where will the next pound or the next bite come from? Undertake for them, we pray. May they see that the church, although virtual at this time, still has hands and feet to be able to deliver the care that they so desperately need. Father, this is a time when the church will pray for one another. And Lord, even at this time, may other congregations see that we can pray for them. And so Lord, how good it was to receive a little message from the congregation of First Raff Ryland to say that they are praying for us at this time. And Lord, we pray for them, that they might seek new ways of being able to communicate the gospel as they think about ways of being able to broadcast their services and as they think about ministry and as they think about the gospel in that area of your vineyard. We pray, Lord, for our, our mission personnel across the world. We pray for Linda, who was due to be here today with her friends from Romania. Lord, we pray that you'd help them, help those, Lord, in Romania and in Moldova, um, who we hear so much from, Lord, that you'd bless them and, and be with them. Be with Chubba and Alona in Romania too, those who we partner with in the summertime. May they know, Lord, that their work is so desperately vital and that we are praying for them even here in Northern Ireland. We pray for our friends across the world, those who will be tuning in, those mission personnel that are perhaps watching from afar. May they too know of the grace and the mercy and the peace that comes from you. So, Father, we thank you that we can pray. We pray, Lord, for the world, but we pray, Lord, that the world at this time would see Jesus, that it would bow its knees before the King of kings and Lord of lords, recognizing you as sovereign and Lord. Lord, you've used disaster. You've used catastrophe before. So, Lord, bring the nations to you. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to continue in the worship of God as we sing our next praise, which is, You are my strength when I am weak. My strength when I am weak, you are the treasure that I seek, you are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up I'd be a fool, you are my all in all. Jesus, love. Of God, worthy is your name, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Take my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy your name, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. 
So as you know, in our morning services, we've been working our way through the Ten Commandments. And so we're going to put that on a little hold for the weeks whenever we're outside of the meeting house. And I've decided instead to preach through the, the life of the Old Testament character of Joseph. We've seen the verse, Genesis 15, verse 20, what the enemy meant for evil, God means for good. And so that verse is tied up in the story of Joseph. So I've thought about why not when we lock down and lock in, why don't we lock down and lock in with Joseph over these coming weeks? We're going to read together from Genesis chapter 37. And in it, we find the first of the, the Joseph narrative. And we're going to be working our way through this over the course of the next few weeks. Genesis chapter 37, commencing to read from verse 1. This is God's infallible word. We need it at this time. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pastoring the flock of his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe, a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheave arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. And when he told it to his father and said to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to them, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him to the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dotham. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dotham. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come, now let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. And when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness. Do not lay a hand on him that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. 
And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. And when Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they saw the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him into Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Amen. And we end our reading here at the end of verse 36, and we pray for God to bless this reading to our souls as we study it together. So during this time of lockdown, um, if you could get your hands on this little book, Joseph, The Hidden Hand of God by Liam Golliker. It's a good book, a good book for you to perhaps spend time reading. It's good to be able to, at this time, be able to fill our minds um, with good books whenever there are good books out there to use at this time. So as you know, in our evening services, we've been looking at the, the book of Genesis and we've been looking at the origins um, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we see the first marriage, the first Sabbath, the first sin. And so we're going to put that on hold and jump 34 chapters to Genesis chapter 37 as we look at this Old Testament character, the character of Joseph. What all does Joseph involve? What all does it include? Well, we see Joseph the boy, 17 years of age, plunged into the pit pulled into the prison, and eventually placed in the palace. In the book of Genesis, Joseph speaks more than any other character. In fact, Joseph speaks more than any other Old Testament character. In fact, uh, Joseph is the character recorded most in the whole of the book of Genesis. This isn't a story about Joseph, though. This is a story about God, his plan of salvation his protecting of his people, his preserving his line, and his pressing in when we're hard-pressed. There's four references to Joseph in the New Testament, and yet as we see the character of Joseph, we see that, if you like, he is a shadow, a type of Christ. Yes, he is Jacob's son, but he points us starkly to God's son, the Lord Jesus. Indeed, the Theologian A.W. Pink parallels 101 different verses that are relevant between Joseph and the Lord Jesus. Genesis speaks of Joseph, so does the psalm, Psalm 105. And Psalm 105 in verse 15 says, God sent a man before us, and his name is Joseph. And so before us, we have Joseph well-known story. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, why is the Reverend Murr going to preach a series of sermons on a well-known character? Pyramid Rock, the Holiday Bible Club series, we've done it here in this church. Perhaps you've been to the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical and sung the songs, Andrew and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Perhaps your children have Disney's King of Dreams and you've watched that. You've got storybook Bibles, that portray this story, and you think to yourself, we know the story. But I reckon during our time out, we'll see God's great providential direction. We'll see God's providential hand, not only on Joseph's life, but in our own lives. As we're shut up, up with our families, might not be rosy. Joseph's family wasn't a rosy family either. In fact, a real dysfunctional family. 
And so to help us, three points this morning. The first one, point one. Joseph, a delight at one. Joseph, a delight at one. We're introduced to Joseph here in Genesis chapter 39. Sorry, Genesis chapter 37. 17 years of age. Um, Israel, Jacob has 12 sons. We're told that in verse 3. But Joseph is number one. Not the firstborn, but the favorite. Jacob loves him more than all of his other sons. He was the first son of Rachel, Jacob's favorite wife. He is the bee's knees. He is the best. He is the son that Jacob delights in. This wasn't good practice. Parents watching this this afternoon, it's not good to have favorites. Yes, Jacob was a patriarch, but he was still born in sin and shaped in iniquity, and it was wrong for him to have Joseph as his favorite. He should have known better. Remember his own upbringing. Remember how Esau, his twin brother, was favored by his father. And that brought about great division in his own household. So Jacob should have known better. Joseph is favored in verse 3. We see him being given his royal robe, his richly ornamented colored robe. This would have meant that instead of going out into the fields and working with his brothers, he was elevated. He would have been schooled, probably read and wrote in ways that his brothers would only have dreamed. Joseph was distinguished. He was the father his son delighted in, the son of Rachel. But Jacob loved this son because Joseph was also obedient to his father. Just like the Lord Jesus, who we read of in the New Testament, that he delighted in his father's business, Joseph was the same. In verse 13 here of Genesis 37, we're told about how Jacob sends Joseph to check up on his brothers. He sent to Shechem, and then he finds out that they're actually in Dothan. 65 miles of travel. He walks for his father. He's obedient. He's an obedient son. He does what his father says. His father delights in him very much, but in a way that is not good. Again, a note of caution here. If you're shut up for a few days in the home with your children. And as we look at, at verses 5 to 11, we see Joseph is a uh, Joseph's dreaming. Um, God gives him two dreams. And actually in the sharing of those dreams, we see a smugness, a smugness which is not good. But actually later on in the book of Genesis, we see that as, as Joseph comes before Pharaoh, as Pharaoh tells Joseph his dreams, actually Joseph says that these are God-given dreams. So in Genesis 37, Joseph has two dreams. Take note of this. Joseph will be above his brothers, and so he should be delighted in. He should be the son that is delighted in. And of course, as we're thinking about Joseph being a type of Christ, pointing us to Christ, how can we not think of those verses in the New Testament as God from heaven looks on his own son, the Lord Jesus, and says, this is my own dear son in whom I am well pleased a son you can delight in, a son who gives you his robe of righteousness. Joseph, the delighted one. Secondly, we see Joseph, the despised one. Joseph, the despised one. Now, Joseph's brothers are aghast at these dreams. My goodness, how can this delighted one, this favorite of daddy, now say that we're all going to come one day and bow down before him? They're aghast. They're raging. They're furious. Can they believe their ears? We're privied, actually, to what they actually think. Genesis chapter 37 and verse 4. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Verse 5, they hated him. In verse 8, they hated him. To see him in his robe, to hear his dreams, they hate the delighted in son. They hate the fact that he would one day reign over them. 
the despised one. How again can this not point us to the despised son, a picture of the Lord Jesus? Again, if we're to jump in the Old Testament to Isaiah chapter 53, this is a portion that we've read often in church, but yet when we read that whole account, Isaiah 53, words that are written 700 years before even the birth of the Lord Jesus, and yet Isaiah records this in his prophecy. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was not despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. The the despised one. Joseph points us again to Jesus. And yet, in the same way the brothers hated this son, this delighted son, the world hates God's delighted son. We've been studying the Ten Commandments. And the world hates the Ten Commandments. They hate to be told about fidelity. They hate to be told about the truthfulness and the biblical perspective of marriage. They hate to be told that there is a God who reigns. The world hates this son. The world hates the fact that there is a king who we are to pray to, a king who we are to bow before, a king who has authority, the son, in fact, who has authority. The world hates this son. And actually, even in the midst of us about to go into lockdown, as some leaders of our country have called for a national day of prayer, that has been rejected because the world hates the sun. And actually, as we see the world hating the sun, how can we not look and see coronavirus as a way in which God is trying to bring the world back to him? The delighted son the despised, the despised one. And thirdly, Joseph, the deserted one. The deserted one. As we carry on in the story, Genesis chapter 37, 12 to 17, things aren't over yet for Joseph. He's not just hated, but actually as his father sends him to check up on his brothers, He's 65 miles away from Jacob, his father. Verse 18 tells us that the brothers see him from a distance. They probably see the colorful robe. He's on his way to check up on them, and we're about to encounter a very sad tale. They plot to kill the dreamer, as we're told here in verse 18. They don't even call him by his name. They call him the dreamer, the little poke fun name that they probably have for him among themselves. And they decide, instead of killing him, to throw him into a cistern. But again, notice the providential finger of God into a cistern that is empty. They just happen to be on a trading route. We're privy here to the heart of the brothers, the crooked and, and wretched heart here of the brothers. And then Reuben stands forward and says, don't kill him, we want to rescue him. And the brothers throw him into the cistern. And actually, there's a despicable thing happens here. Because we're told that as they throw him into the pit, they stop for food. They have their lunch. They get their fish and chips. They pour themselves their coffee. And they have a little feast. Tea and cake, while Joseph perhaps screams from the pit, help me, have mercy on me. The text doesn't say that Joseph screamed, but actually later on in Genesis 42 and verse 21, the brothers actually say that they could hear his cries. As they look back on this account, they actually record that they could hear him and his plea for mercy. Traders arrive from Midian on their way to Egypt, and Judah suggests selling this Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. They get a goat 
They kill it, they cover the robe with blood, they rip the colorful, ornate robe, and they take this robe to their father, and actually their father comes up with the conclusion that their son, that his son has been killed. Jacob decides that a, a wild animal must have killed his precious son. Verse 36. Had they got rid of their brother? What the enemy meant for evil, God meant it for good. Here we see providence, providio, foresight. Here we see the finger of God and the life of Joseph, who would actually be the salvation of his brothers. The Westminster Shorter Catechism tells us, question 11, what are God's works of providence? God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. It might be useful over these days ahead to perhaps learn some scripture verses that will help you focus upon the God of providence, to take God's word and hide it in your heart. Psalm 145 and verse 17 one example where we read of providence. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. Psalm 104, verse 24. Again, good to be able to learn, memorize, think about Scripture as we spend time perhaps away or in lockdown or in isolation. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. God is a God of providence. Psalm 103, verse 19, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. The great uh, Reformed theologian John Calvin says this, It is certain that not one drop of rain falls without God's command. God is a God of providence, a God who we can rely on at this time. And so, through even just Genesis 37, this opening portion of the life of Joseph, Joseph the delighted one, Joseph the despised one, Joseph the deserted one, points us to the delighted son, the Lord Jesus, the despised son who took the punishment for your sin. But even as we take refuge and shelter in God during this national catastrophe and this crisis, actually we're not deserted. Neither was Joseph, and neither are we as we take shelter under the wings of the Almighty. Let's not forget our little, our little symbols that we use as we reflect. What's the light bulb as we've heard God's word this morning? What has switched on for you for the first time? What's the question mark? What's the question from this passage? Feel free to text me it or email me it. Let's still engage during this time. What's the arrow? What are you going to do as a result of this? And what's the heart? How does this passage make you love God even more? Jehovah, 
Fairest of fountain, whence the healing stream doth flow. Let their filthy cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, be thou still my strength, my shield. Be thou still my strength and shield. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fears subside. Death of death and hell's destruction land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises, songs of praises I will ever give to thee. Let's just close our time of praise now with the benediction. Last week, it was lovely to stood and to sung the words of the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the starry host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And Lord, and, and as I left, some people said, are you thinking that we won't be here again next week? And that obviously came to be so... Um, but we still want to end our service with words of blessing, words of unity. So let's just pray together. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.